our next speaker is Mike Reed. And originally I met Mike through a program that I did with the company that he runs called Debt Global. And what these guys do is they're the masters at taking six and seven, six and seven figure coaching based businesses and transforming all the intellectual property from years and years of mastering your craft and doing the stuff that you guys do best and taking it from what's actually inside your head and then putting it into a, a system where you can take someone from A to B to C and then charge for that. Because all the information is super valuable inside your head and all the learning and everything you've learned during this weekend and then any other courses that you might have done with training or whatever, or nutrition, all add up to, to substantial knowledge. And it's thousands and thousands of dollars for everyone in here. And what Dan and what Mike is gonna talk about here today is how to get that out of your head and into a, a very specific system to help enable your clients or, and, and multiple clients to, to scale and, and make that happen. So Mike Reed, welcome to uh, the Fitness Summit. Thanks. Uh... Thanks, Hado. Um, ladies and gents, can I please get everyone just to stand up just for a minute, just to shift a bit of the energy? And um, first and foremost, I want to say that uh, we run conferences with hundreds of business owners at a time, and I know it's super valuable for you guys to be here, but um, I tell you what, it's a no mean feat to put on an event like this. So can everyone just please put their hands together for Mr. Hayden Wilson? <laughs> he's uh, he's done, a, done an awesome job. Thanks, guys. Feel free to, feel free to sit down. So let me... Let me give a quick bit of context. And I, can I just grab the, the clicker as well? Quick bit of context on, uh, on what I do. I run a, a training and advisory company called Dent Global. So we're, uh, we run structured business accelerators for the founders of six and seven figure revenue service businesses. So a lot of our clients are accountants and lawyers, chiropractors, physios, personal trainers, coaches, consultants, any service based business and we uh, operate in seven cities around the world. We've worked with two and a half thousand founders to really help them to build their brand, raise their profile, stand out in their industry and to scale their business. So if there were two key things that we focus on, one is around brand and differentiation, how they stand out in their industry and the other is around scale, how they build a more scalable business model around what they do, which is really going to be the theme of what I want to uh, share today in terms of how you productize your service and um, the principles that I'll talk about are based on a number of best-selling books. Our flagship book is called Key Person of Influence. Who, any, anyone in the audience read that or come across it? Cool, so, um, so that book was released by my business partner Daniel about six years ago. He's written a number of other best-selling books since then and we put on some large-scale conferences. We run strategy workshops with a faculty of mentors, men and women around the world who've sold businesses for tens of millions, they've got globally recognized brands. So a lot of the insights that I share don't see me as the, the business guru, um, but we bring together a pretty incredible faculty of men and women who, uh, who work with our clients and I guess see me as a bit of a conduit to some of their expertise. And there's a high degree of accountability and implementation around what it is that we do. So there's kind of three themes that I want to talk about, but I'm also conscious of the fact that uh, whoever, for everyone who's got, gotten up and shared and spoken already, We've already covered a bit of this stuff too. So I'm curious to hear from you guys. In the service of answering the question, how do you turn your service and your skills and your experience into products and productize so that it's not so reliant on you and your time? What are the questions? What are the concerns? What are the things that you guys really want to know? And then I'll see if I can build that into what we talk about as well. Just feel free to shout it out. Awesome. And specifically in terms of how do you just how do you design the product so that you don't necessarily have to show up and deliver it all the time? Okay. Cool. What else? Okay. Cool. Awesome. What are some of the other things? Not all at once, though. <laughs> I was wondering about what's a way to really link finding out what that market really wants. 
Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Good question. Any other things? Okay, cool. Awesome. So I'm going to tr do my best to try and answer those things as we go. But um, there's three themes I want to talk about. So one is around what I'd refer to as your mountain of value. So you guys, I'm assuming if you go out and you currently service clients, you get a result for them, you've already got the raw material to be able to go out and productize your service. The important thing is having the raw material in the first place. Then how you unpack that and extract that IP and then turn it into products is, is really the next step. We need to ask, answer the question or be clear on why people actually buy to actually create a product as well. And then I'll talk a bit about product ecosystems. But before we get into that, I just want to wrap a bit of context around the entrepreneur journey because we've worked with two and a half thousand businesses across 50 different industries and there's a very predictable journey that every business goes on. And the funny thing is, is that when you get so close to your own business, often you can everyone relate to the fact you lose a bit of perspective and you, sometimes it's hard to see the forest for the trees, but of all the businesses that we've worked with, everyone goes through this very predictable uh, growth cycle. And there's a number of different phases, but there's kind of three key phases. The first is about proving a value proposition, right? proving that you've got something that actually solves a real problem for the market. When you've done that and you've proven that you've got something that's valuable and the market wants to buy and it solves a problem, the next step's about building brand and influence around that. So helping that value proposition in your business become more visible, known, recognized. The third is about formalizing IP into assets. And I'll talk a bit about what I mean by that in a sec, but actually building assets that allow a team to go out and build a business on your behalf so you're not the person having to show up and do it all the time. And in the process of getting my water, I've lost my clicker. However, there's a lot of noise in this journey. And so one of the meta concepts I want, want to talk about, and I want everyone to be uh, aware of, is this idea that ultimately income follows assets. Now, traditionally, when we think about scaling income and generating more revenue, what are most business owners default to? What do they think they need to do more of? Yeah, like sales and marketing, right? However, think about that analogy in the context of, let's say, a house. So let's say you owned a two-bedroom house in a certain location in Melbourne, and you knew, you knew you could rent it for 500 bucks a week. Now imagine I said, right, I'd like to generate more income from that house. I'm going to go out and run a really slick sales and marketing campaign. I'm going to hire the best sales agents. We're going to triple our marketing spend. How much additional rent do you think I'd get for that house? Not much. Why? Yeah, totally, right? So it's a two-bedroom house. There's only so much rent you, extra rent you can get from that house. However, if I was able to extend the house, if I was able to maybe add another level, turn it into four bedrooms, without even thinking about sales and marketing, what would happen to my rent? Double the rent, right? Fundamentally, because the underlying asset is now a bigger, more valuable asset. When you're a service business, what is the asset that you've got? The IP, right? However, most service businesses are vastly undercapitalized in how they formalize their IP. So when I use the, the phrase intellectual property, I'm talking about the stuff that's in your head. Your skills, your experience, your stories, your recipes, your formulas, how you actually deliver an outcome and a result to the market. But on a scale of 1 to 10, right now, how, how well do you feel you've currently unpacked that IP and formalized it into collateral products, etc.? where that IP could get delivered and generate a result whether or not you're in the room. Where would you put yourselves on the scale? Low, medium, high? Low, right? And so if you want to scale income and you haven't unpacked that IP, it's kind of analogous to going out and flogging a one-bedroom house and expecting to get more rent. 
you need to develop a bigger and more valuable asset, which is extracting and unpacking that IP. So before we get into products, I want to talk a bit about product ecosystems and how we see uh, you need to develop a few different layers of product. A few starting principles, which I appreciate everyone's I heard a little bit about before, but this is just a bit of our take and my take on, uh, on what's it important to have in place before you get to product creation. So number one, uh, you're awesome A communicating, which has really got everything to do with pitch. So a great product stems from a great pitch. Now this is a pitching framework that we take our clients through that helps them to communicate their value proposition. Anyone who wants that, just send me an email, happy to email it to you. But there is a universal way that we process information and we evaluate decisions and evaluate ideas. This framework helps to take someone through the logical way you need to communicate those ideas to be able to get them to the point where they're primed, ready to buy, they're sold. However, unfortunately that's not come out very well on the slide, um, you do get what you pitch for. So if you pitch everyone, you're going to get no one, which is really coming back to this principle of niching and why it's so important. When Amazon first started, Amazon's big mission, their game, was to uh, become the world's general store. Right? So they wanted to be the world's online general store. You could buy anything and everything online from Amazon. Recently, they've just bought Whole Foods, uh, just last week. Anyone fam familiar with Whole Foods in, in the US? So Whole Foods is a, an organic supermarket chain. They've just bought Whole Foods. It's going to radically disrupt the way that uh, you buy your groceries online. What was the niche they started with? Books, right? Um, why do you think that might be a good place to start? What are some of the advantages in that instance of niching? Yeah, cool. Easy to distribute. Right, so the same, think about the same principle for what it is that you do. It's so easy to distribute. Low variability in the distribution. Lower cost. Right? All those kind of factors mean that very solving a specific problem, therefore very specific solution. So Lazo is a client of ours in the UK. His pitch is I do radical 12-week body transformations for business leaders and celebrities who achieve amazing results at work, but ordinary things naked. And that's his pitch, and that's his particular niche. Uh, Bridget Hunt's another client. She, her niche is being the six-pack chick. So just remember that your niche is where you start. It's not necessarily where you end. In Amazon's instance, they want to be the world's general store. However, they needed to start with niching because to, ha to, to niche means to lower the variability in the costs and the complexity of actually delivering a result. If it's easier and simpler to deliver a result, you can therefore deliver a more remarkable outcome to a specific problem the market's got. Does that make sense? So these are three things that we get our clients to think about, very high level, when it comes to picking who's the ideal target market they should be working with. Number one is, can they create a high degree of transformation? Can they actually really change their customer's life, solve a significant problem? The bigger the transformation, the more they're able to charge. Second thing is, have they got the money to pay? And then the third is, do they have a love and an affinity, affinity for working with those people? So no point working with someone that you can really change their life. Uh, they've got the money to spend, but you hate them. Conversely, no point working with anyone that uh, you can really change their life. You love working with them, but they're broke. So those are three things that you want to think about when it comes to who is the ideal target market and niche that you want to uh, pick. You need to know your niche before you can create a really valuable product. As soon as your niche changes, the problems of that niche and that market change, and therefore the solution and the product's going to change. So everything comes back to who are you targeting, therefore what are their problems, and therefore then you can start to think about what's the right solution to actually solve that and, and develop that solution in a way that's productized, that means you don't have to necessarily show up and deliver it. So some of the common mistakes is just trying to be too fancy, inventing terminology when it comes to pitching. Uh, clarity trumps, uh, or simplicity trumps complexity, and the objective of a pitch isn't to try and differentiate through using fancy terminology and fancy language. It's just to be really super clear as to what you do, how you solve problems for the market, and why you do it. Clarity always wins. And being inconsistent is a bit of a mistake as well. The second broad topic before we dive deeper into product is um, 
asking the question, why do people buy? And I've said, it's not about you. Right? That's probably one of the key things I want you to keep in mind. People will only pay for value they can see and recognize. So question, hopefully you know the answer to this by the end of uh, hearing a few other people talk. Why do people buy? Problem to solve? Anyone have any different answers? Pain or pleasure, okay. Any agree, okay. They like you, yeah. Sass. Cool, right, all good reasons. I put it to you, everything stems back to solving a problem. The only reason anyone buys anything and the only reason business exists is you're there to solve problems for your market. There are superficial needs, wants, and desires, but those things are surface level, they're superficial. Um, let's say I want a brand new BMW M3. Now I might want the car, but I don't necessarily buy the car. Why not? Don't need it, okay, yeah. Or I don't necessarily have a problem that that car might solve. Whereas if I was a real estate agent and I was rocking up to uh, the house that I was employed to sell in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, which I'm expecting to get two and a half million bucks for in my 1998 Ford Falcon, what's the problem with that? That doesn't send, doesn't send the right signal to the vendor, does it? And so all of a sudden that now could jeopardize my ability to do business with that person. I might lose the opportunity to uh, sell the house. Uh, therefore, I lose my income. Therefore, that has an impact on my livelihood, my wife, my ability to send my kids to school. All of a sudden there is a, a deep emotional uh, problem and impact as a result of not having that car. Therefore, uh, I have a good reason to now want to buy the car. Whereas if, let's say, showing off that status isn't necessary for me to perform well in my business or um, I don't necessarily rock up to clients' houses or whatever it may be, it's not a big enough problem for me to solve, therefore, therefore I'm not going to do anything about it. So just remember with your clients, the more that you can connect them to their underlying problems at a, at a deep emotional level, the more they're moved to take action to resolve them. So this guy isn't very connected to his lifestyle and eating problems, is he? However, if, you can if you're able to collapse the future implications and impact of those lifestyle choices today from the impact it's going to have in the future back to the present moment, all of a sudden he's far more compelled to change. Diabetes later on, reduction in longevity, uh, not being around for his wife, his kids, all these kind of things, that emotional connection to a future implication of a problem is the thing that's going to move him to take action today. So to develop a really pa uh, a remarkable product, you need to have a PhD in your customers' problems, really understand them intimately. And that's the foundation of developing valuable, remarkable products. Most of the businesses we come across and we work with, whether they're doing hundreds of thousands of revenue or millions in revenue, how well they understand their customers' problems. They go through our process of really digging into uh, the symptoms, the causes, uh, the mistakes they were making in the first place that led to those problems, the implications, the emotional impact across all spheres of life, economic, social, relational. And they're like, shit, we thought we knew our customers' problems, but we didn't really. And it's, even if you do understand what's driving and motiv motivating them, the next question is how well are you communicating that to them? How well are you helping them to connect to those problems? The better you can help them connect to it, the more uh, you've got an ability to be able to have them take action, but also develop a really remarkable solution to those problems. However, as soon as someone's aware they've got a problem and they need to change, what do they then want? A solution, okay. What does that mean? Say again? Okay, take them out of their pain. But essentially they want an outcome. They want a result. 
and what we call the prize. Now, this prize is completely separate to you. I hate to tell you, but no one gives a shit about you. <laughs> what they care about is they want an outcome and a result for them in their life. And so your job is to be able to help to really clearly and powerfully communicate how you get them to an outcome and what it's going to look and feel like in that new state of being. You and your experience and your qualifications and all those kind of things don't feel like you need to be the guru to be able to deliver a prize and an outcome to your market. You just need to be able to articulate that prize and deliver a product to them that with enough certainty and with enough consistency and repeatability can get them to that prize. Does that make sense? So for example, uh, Nicole Eccles is a entrepreneur. She runs a company called Glasshouse Fragrances. She came along to do a talk with our clients recently. It's a $50 million business. All her candles are named after particular destinations. Because when you light the candle, it delivers a really beautiful fragrance. The intention is to take someone to a whole other destination, for them to come home, to light the candle, and all of a sudden they feel like they're at Bora Bora, or they're on the Amalfi Coast, or they're at the Galapagos, or Kyoto, or wherever it may be. So people care about the destination. They care about the prize. They don't care about you and your skills and your experience. They, all they care about is the prize. Now, you need to have an ability to be able to deliver that consistently and make sure you can present that. But one of the most powerful distinctions that our clients get is when they start to separate the driver from the vehicle and see that it's not about them. It's actually about their methodologies, their recipes, their formulas, how they actually get people to a prize that's the value. It's the IP that's in the head, it's not you. So Mike Campbell uh, runs a, he's a uh, uh, personal trainer and personal development coach. The prize he delivers to his market is called Unleash Your Alpha. So he helps guys become alpha males. And he's written the book on it, and that's the prize he delivers. Uh, Darren Finkelstein sells boats in Melbourne, but he doesn't actually sell boats. Really, what he does is he helps people to reconnect and he delivers quality time. That's the outcome, that's the prize he delivers. The boat's just the conduit, the vehicle that actually gets people to that desired state. Uh, Brad Beer in Brisbane runs a physio practice. His prize he delivers is physio with a finish line. Because what's one of the biggest complaints you've got when you go to your physio? You just keep going, you're just stuck there forever and ever, consult after consult. So he realized, right, that's exactly all the fears and the concerns that his clients had what did they actually really want? If he was to reverse engineer, what's the outcome they want? They want a result. They want to, they want to fix their knee, right? Whether it takes them six weeks, six months, it doesn't matter. They want an outcome. And so he rebranded his program uh, to physio with a finish line. And that became the prize that he delivers. Jen Degard uh, is in Sydney. Uh, her prize is love your body as much as you love your baby. Right? And she does uh, fitness training for mums after giving birth. Howard Tinker runs a restaurant marketing company. He realized restaurants don't give a stuff about marketing tactics. All they care about are more bums on seats. They just want a full restaurant. That's the prize. That's the outcome. And that becomes the focal point of how he and it, all of our clients go out and start to present the value proposition of what it is that they do. Now, we'll get to product in a sec in terms of packaging that value proposition. But when it comes to presenting what it is that you're doing that's really addressing a real problem, it's getting people to an outcome, you want to lead with what's the prize you're delivering. The prize that we deliver to our market is helping you become a key person of influence. That's the prize, that becomes the focal point, and, the, and everything that we talk about, the DNA of our content, is answering that one question, how to become a key person of influence. So I'd encourage everyone here to think about what's the prize you're delivering to your market, what's the end result and the outcome, and then that be the focal point of all the content you're creating, the products and services that you develop, your entire business essentially. Now, this is a question to ponder in the service of creating a really remarkable, valuable product. And it's to make a promise that you don't have the personal capacity to deliver upon. Now, is anyone sitting there going, what the? 
So, I make a promise to the market that I can help you become a key person of influence. Right? It's five elements to that, five steps. However, I don't have the personal capacity to deliver on that outcome. It is such a complete, such a remarkable outcome, what it really means to be a key person of influence in your in industry, visible, valuable, connected, showing up in media, uh, getting all the opportunities of your industry, uh, attracting really great talent and team, uh, scaling income, profitable, all those things. That's a promise that goes beyond what I can personally deliver upon. I'm one of the co-founders of the company. However, the product brings together an incredible faculty of people who are far more qualified in each of those elements to be able to get people to the outcome. So one of the principles of being a key person of influence is that you need to publish really great content. Now, I haven't written a book, probably not a good person to teach how to write one. Andrew Griffith, who's our publishing guy, he's written 12 best-selling books, he's got a million in print, he writes for Inc.com. Um, he's widely recognized as Australia's number one small business author. He's a far more qualified person to deliver upon that outcome of publish than I am. Matthew Michaelwitz, pitching guy, sold his business for 50 million bucks. And he's a far more qualified person to teach someone around the specifics of pitching. Imagine one of the reasons why Henry Ford really kind of revolutionized the, uh, the production line and production of vehicles was he, he created the production line. So every component of the vehicle was, was done by one specific person. Right? And there was a big long line of people putting together each of the individual components. Now to find one person who could do all the components of the production line, they'd have to be a super talented person to deliver a remarkable product like the Model T Ford. Everyone agree? However, if you could bring together a whole army of and a swarm of people, each doing the individual components, it's a much easier thing to bring those components together, but the end outcome deliver, still delivers a remarkable result. So it kind of removes the, the risk uh, from the process. So this is a very simplistic framework of the foundation of how you develop a really valuable product, but it's recognizing the only reason people buy is to solve a problem. Right? So you need to really intimately understand what are the problems that you're solving. But as soon as someone gets they've got a problem, all they want is a prize and an outcome. And based on all your experience and uh, the way you've solved problems for your clients in the past and all that kind of thing, I put it to you, you've all got the raw material of how you get people from problem to prize in your head right now. And so one of the exercises you can do to help unpack what's the journey that you need to take someone on from problem to prize is List, what are the, if you had the perfect prospect come along, who had all the problems that you could solve, and they were chronic problems, and you were to map a journey for them. Right? If there were a hundred things that they needed to do on that journey over a certain period of time to get to the prize, what would those things be? And in my experience, to deliver a remarkable transformation to people, to really change their life and deliver a powerful result, it, it takes time. There's no such thing as a, a quick fix in life. And hence why we, we do what we do over a 12 month period because when you guys are working with your clients, if you gave them all the information they needed to get a result in a seven day period and then left them to their own devices, what would happen? They wouldn't get the result, right? <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was me or was it someone else. Or, um, I don't, exactly, right? They wouldn't absorb it and they, they wouldn't be accountable to actually getting the result. Uh, we've found that to keep people accountable to really getting an outcome and to transforming them, uh, it needs to happen over a period of time and chunk by chunk, bit by bit. And so for us, we found there were five overarching categories and principles of things that someone needed to focus on to get to our prize and our outcome. Pitch, publish, product, profile, partnerships. Those are the elements of our methodology. Everyone here, if you've delivered an outcome and a result to clients before, you have a process, you have a methodology, but it's in your head. And to go on the journey to developing a product that can be delivered whether or not you're in the room, you have to unpack that methodology and that recipe out of your head and start to formalize it. And a product is, a, is an asset, 
uh, brochures that help communicate that pathway and that methodology as an asset, we need to start developing uh, your intellectual property assets. Is that making sense? Questions so far? Cool. Uh, so Catherine Maslin is a naturopath. She, just another example, she, um, she runs a wellness clinic in Brisbane. When she started this process, she was working with people 100 bucks an hour, that type of thing. Problem she had was they'd come in chronic health issues and she'd start working with them. Half a dozen appointments in, they'd abandon the process. And she, when she went through this, she realized, she's like, shit, if someone has chronic health issues, for them to get to a, uh, a state of get well, stay well, which is the prize that she delivers, it would take about a six month journey, but what she could, uh, based on her skills and experience, her capability as a naturopath, that was only part of the story. So when she reverse engineered her own health transformation and going from problem to the outcome that she had, uh, there, was exercise, there, there was a whole bunch of exercise components, there was nutrition, there was mindset, all these things that she needed to work on and that her typical client needed to work on to get to the prize. And, uh, and so what that meant was it forced her to have to bring in the other people within her uh, practice to uh, deliver upon that outcome. And so she brought in an exercise scientist, she brought in a mindset coach, she brought in a nutritionist. And uh, she runs a, she's a naturopath essentially, but she's got quite a disruptive model in her industry. Uh, people don't pay per consult now, they pay a membership fee. So every two weeks they're on a direct debit and they pay a fortnightly direct debit fee. It's a minimum six month contract and that gets them access to an environment where they can come in and work with all those different modalities and those people. A certain number of consultations, supplementation, all sorts of different things. Whether, like a gym membership, whether they come in for uh, you know, once a week or three or four times a week, uh, the point is it's access to the environment to get to an outcome and a result, which is get well, stay well. And whether it takes them three months, six months, 12 months, it's not time dependent. And that's an important element to breaking out of the paradigm of time for money is realizing your clients aren't buying your time. They don't give a stuff about you. They just want an outcome. And so you need to reverse engineer how do you deliver an outcome to them that's independent of time. So, let's get into uh, some stuff around more around product and product ecosystems. Ultimately, um, it, it is product ecosystems that make money, and I'll talk about what I mean by that in a sec. Uh, not any one individual product or service. So, again, happy to send uh, any of these frameworks that anyone wants them to send me an email at mike at dent.global. This is what we, we call an ascending transaction model. So we've found that for all our clients, there are uh, a number of different layers of product they need to create. Uh, the first layer is what we call a gift. The next layer is called a product for prospect. Then your core business. And then product for clients. And I'll explain uh, what they mean as we go. So core product is a package. And the more complete and the remarkable that package, the harder it is to uh, commoditize it, or for it to become commoditized. So if you think about something like a Porsche, um, many, many uh, elements that come together to, to be able to deliver a really complete and remarkable package. However, I want you to consider, when it comes to uh, selling your core product, you've got a marketplace of prospects out there. And I want you to imagine there's two sides of your market. There are all the people who have the problems that you can solve and they're aware they've got the problems. So they're actively looking for, let's say, a trainer. And then there are all the other people in the market who would potentially be great prospects, uh, but they're not well connected to how their lifestyle choices today are really gonna cause a problem down the line. Everyone relate to those two sides of the market? So the question for everyone is, where do you think there are more of your potential target market? In the dormant side or the looking and active side? Dormant? By small margin, big margin? Huge, right? Absolutely. It doesn't matter whether it's your industry, our industry, every industry, every market, there are way more people 
on the uh, unaware, little bit ignorant side of the fence. Now, where do you think you or most of your competition are targeting their sales, marketing, advertising efforts? Active, why? Seems easier. But what's the problem with that? Everyone else is doing it. So it's very hard to differentiate when you're naturally being compared against a whole bunch of other potential providers. What's the problem with trying to get to people on the dormant side? Huh? Where do you find them? Okay. What else? They're potentially closed off to it. So fair to say the people on the dormant side, they need education before they're ready to buy. Now the question is, based on everything that's in your heads, if you met that dormant person at a dinner party, and you could sit down and over a glass of wine, you could have conversations with them. You could ask them questions, you could tell them stories, case studies, you could uh, you know, talk about formulas and methods and recipes and all this kind of thing. Could you kind of metaphorically turn a light bulb on to be able to move them from unaware to all of a sudden now aware of the mistakes and the problems they've got? Yeah, cool, already in your head? So, perfect, right, if it's in your head, that's all you need. The problem is it's in your head. So if you have to show up and deliver that education, it's a, you don't, can't possibly have, it's not a scalable way to educate the market. However, if you are to deliver that light bulb moment, imagine, think, like, think of a situation in your life where someone's really turned a light bulb on for you and all of a sudden you've, you're unaware of something before and now you've got perspective and you're aware. In that moment of that light bulb going off, what does it imply about the person that's given it to you? That they're an expert, right? If they understand you better than you understand yourself, it implies they've certainly, certainly gives a strong reason that they've got uh, the ability to be able to now address and solve the problem, yeah? So just by implication of giving someone a light bulb moment, it implies that you've got the ability to solve their problem. And what happens to the competition in that moment? Yeah, they become far less relevant. And so the pathway to differentiation, my experience, has got less to do with fancy bells and whistles of your branding and logo and color of your website or, or things like that. That's all superficial vapid and stuff. It's when you can unpack the stuff that's in your head and turn it into collateral content assets that help deliver those light bulb moments at scale that's when you really crack into a whole other uh, market. So uh, Darren, the boat guy, who I mentioned before, previously he was thinking about, okay, runs a boat sales business, sell boats, that's what I do. And so he went through the, our process of actually producing a book about how to buy a boat. And, he's, and he, he was resistant to it. He's like, I don't want to write a book about how to buy a boat. He's kind of over selling boats at this point. And we said to Darren, and I'd say to everyone, if you think it's about your product or service, you've already missed the point. Darren, it's not about the boat, you missed the point. And he starts to peel back the layers of his story and who he's, what he's all about and we kind of go through this process with everyone and he's a family man. It's in his DNA to be a family man. He loves to connect with his kids, his wife, go out on camping trips and adventures and get away from technology. He's got all this philosophy around connection and quality time. And he's like, what's any of that got to do with me selling more boats? I'm like, Darren, <laughs> you're too close to it. And, he, and he's like, Oh, shit. And he had that penny dropping realization where he's like, actually, I don't sell boats. Really, what I do is I reconnect people. And so he then wrote a, and I'm like, could you write a book about how to show guys how to reconnect with their family um, where the boat's the vehicle that does that? He's like, oh, I could write the hell out of that book. And so he did, and he created that book. He then did, with that asset that he had, he then went and did a partnership with a big boat insurer, Club Marine, and uh, they covered the cost of the book in return for him putting a bit of ad uh, promotion and, of them throughout the book. So I recommended them as a good supplier, a uh, bit of their branding on the collateral. And, uh, and as a result of that relationship, they promoted the launch of his book to 90,000 boat owners on the database in their monthly newsletter. And literally just, you know, he popped after that point. And, um, he started being invited to do a whole bunch of speaking gigs at little boat shows and trade shows. 
We also got invited to go and do talks at uh, conferences with C-suite type executives, so CEOs, that, that kind of thing, um, who, people who had never considered necessarily getting a boat, or it wasn't high on their priority list. However, he wasn't going along talking about how to buy a boat, he was talking about family and connection and how to actually reconnect with your kids. These are guys who are working, you know, guys and, and women who are working 80 hours a week uh, you know, in the CBD, disconnected from their spouse, uh, didn't really know their kids anymore. And he was going along and talking about all the methods and the philosophy and the strategy of how to reconnect with them. Now, would have he ever been invited to do that talk if he was just talking about his product or service? Absolutely not, right? But because he's talking about the philosophy that sits behind um, delivering a far more meaningful prize, which is around connection and quality time, uh, it opened up a whole dormant market that he never would have normally gotten access to. And so the pathway to being able to access that dormant market is to uh, first uh, unpack those insights and put it into a, a format, an asset, uh, that is more uh, distributable than uh, your, your core business. So if Darren approached Club Marine, the boat insurer, and said, can you promote my business to your database? What do you reckon he would have heard? Get stuffed, right? Whereas instead it's like, hey, I can part, would, you know, would, you like, would you like us to send out a, uh, a copy of the book to everyone on the database? All of a sudden that's a valuable door opener. Now, in this instance, would you consider a book a product? Absolutely it is, right? Um, is it a sales tool? 100% it is, right? It's unpacking what's the conversation you need to have with that person at the dinner party to be able to walk them through all the mistakes in their thinking and all the wrong actions they were making that were causing the problems that you can address in the first place. By the time someone's read that book and they turn up to have a conversation with you about actually addressing those problems, do you think they're going to be far more primed, pre-sold, ready to buy? No, there's not that icky, kind of awkward uh, twisting of the arm sales type stuff. So the purpose of developing these assets and some of these initial layers of product is to uh, help to prime and pre-sell the market so you've got more than enough people that are interested in what you do, but you're not having to go out there and hunt and chase so much. So there's two key layers to what's sitting within your head and your IP. There's stuff that educates the market and stuff that actually delivers an outcome and a result. And so when I said before, and apologies, the, the slides aren't sitting well with um, this version of Keynote, but um, there are four layers of product that we need to develop. One is what we call a gift, so something you can give away freely with no strings attached. So uh, as an example, um, what's, like, what do you guys reckon is a good example of a, a free gift you might give away to the market? Ebook. okay, what else? Webinar, what else? Articles, content, blogs, um, podcast, video, right? all stuff that delivers valuable insights to the market, um, but no strings attached. No, no need for people to opt in, not charging anything. So we've got a, a guy in Melbourne. Um, he runs a, he does soft tissue therapy for thoroughbred performance horses. And um, <laughs> he created a, he just started creating, because of the nature of what he does, it's kind of a mystery to most people as to how he's able to cure horses' injuries. And he, he wipes seconds off a, well, a um, Melbourne Cup winning horse. And so he just started putting a camera in front of every time that he worked on a horse. And he just explained exactly what he was doing and how he was doing it and how triggering this point led to a such and such a mechanical change in the horse and whatever else. And uh, his YouTube channel went to... And, he, and he, ran, he ran some ads around promoting that out to his target market on YouTube. When we met him, he was working part-time in a factory, great at what he does, lots of skills, but uh, not getting enough clients. Did that one strategy of just creating YouTube videos that explained what he was doing, uh, ran a bit of a marketing and ad campaign around it, and now he's booked out three months in advance. Uh, his channel's had, he's got thousands of subscribers, hundreds of thousands of views. And uh, that was the one thing that he created that totally transformed his business. 
So he had a great core business before. He could come in and work with a stable and fix the horse. Not enough people knew about him. One little gift transformed the front end of his, uh, of his business model to generate you know, plenty of uh, leads and opportunity. And so the gifts and the product for prospects are designed to activate the dormant market. So an example of a product for prospect, think of something that might be low cost, um, a very easy first step for your market to take who aren't yet maybe willing to fork over thousands of dollars to work with you because they haven't built the, the requisite level of trust and rapport yet. But if you could offer them something that was valuable and that was a low commitment, uh, and a very easy first step is something that allows them to build trust. So if someone spends 10, 15, 20 bucks buying a copy of our book and spends a couple of hours with it, it's very low commitment to actually buy the book. However, having read the book, it builds the necessary trust to be able to have a conversation around spending thousands of dollars, let's say, in our core business. And if I had to get on the phone and have a sales conversation with what our, one of our prospects, our target marketer, who hadn't read the book, it would be a lot of hard work. Because I'm having to take them through all the basics to be able to get them to the point where they're, you know, we can now have a, uh, a, a kind of a higher level conversation around how we can really address the problems. So one of the uh, products that a lot of our clients create, which we find really effective, uh, is a book. It is one of the most powerful tools to really differentiate you from everyone else. You against five other trainers in your industry, the one who's the author of the book uh, is instantly positioned as more valuable, different, uh, has more expertise. Does, is Jamie Oliver famous because he pr cooks a beautiful meal in a restaurant? No, he's famous because he published his recipes. Uh, the chef, is his skill set in being able to you know, put together a really beautiful meal isn't the thing that's creating the value. It's the recipe. It's the formula. And it's unpacking that and turning it into content assets uh, that is the value creation in this example. So BMW, one of the gifts they give away is they sponsor the rugby, they sponsor the sports events. Those events wouldn't occur without their sponsorship. Uh, product for prospects is they run events at the showroom. The car is the core business. But as soon as you need the car, you need to finance the car. As soon as you want to buy the car, you need to finance the car. And think about the time and energy and effort BMW have to put in to be able to get a customer to the point where they're ready to buy a BMW. Fair amount of client acquisition effort and cost, yeah? However, as soon as someone's made the decision to buy the car, how much additional effort do you think will be required to sell them on the finance? Not a lot at all, right? So your product for customer becomes a super profitable product in your business. The reason why you want to unpack that IP into gifts and product for prospects is it helps to educate the market at scale. So if you have to run around and do the education, that's, that's very time consuming and costly on your time. Whereas I could have 1,000 people reading a copy, 10,000 people reading the Key Person of Influence book, uh, irrespective of my time. Right? So at the front end of your product ecosystem, you want to unpack insights into collateral content, uh, digital assets that help to educate the market at scale then it's going to require your personal effort to be able to convert them into your core business. And there's a bit of time involved in that, especially when you're selling something at a premium that's a, you know, offering a remarkable result, high ticket item. But then the extra effort to be able to convert them into the product for clients is fairly minimal. And so having a product that you can sell your existing client base who already know, like, and trust you, you've already got a strong relationship with, can be a very profitable layer of product to create. Apple does it as well. iTunes is the gift. iPod uh, is the product for prospect. As soon as you download iTunes, click, 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 music, you then got the problem of I need a port. It's not portable. 
I need to carry it around with me. iPod solves that problem, but it also unpacks the bigger problem at the same time of when you've got your iPod, but you've got your Nokia phone, you've got your PC, none of it talks to each other in the cloud. This is going back a few years. Um, and so hence, it's easier to be able to bring it all together into the Mac and have the iPad and everything all talking to each other in the iCloud. And then the apps are the product for clients. So for us, the podcast is an example of a gift. We've got an online diagnostic tool called the uh, KPI quiz. Answer 40 questions, spits out a report, gives a score in our methodology. Um, a, a little bit of tech that we can run Facebook ads, we can push out through partner channels. Uh, it's a valuable thing because it, it, it delivers insights, uh, except doesn't require any of our time to actually generate the lead. And then our core business are our various accelerator programs. So, broad brush, this is what a, a product ecosystem could look like. You've got your free gifts on the front end. Product for prospect might be between 20 to 200 bucks. So it's low ticket, low barrier to entry, easy sell. But the value proposition of a product for prospect needs to be strong. So you need to be able to present something that's 10x more valuable than what the cost is to be able to get people in the door, to build trust. Remember, at this point, you don't have trust. You've got a dormant market. You need to activate them. And then your core business, uh, which isn't a time-based product, but it's a package. It delivers an outcome and a result, irrespective of time. You know, it might be between 30, 3 to 30K. Uh, and then you've got product for clients, which is typically retainer income. So pe you know, people are paying you per month, uh, ongoing. And so the first step is being clear on what's your capacity. Right? So if you want to be generating 250 grand and you've got a $5,000 core product, core package, you need to sell 50 of those in the year. And the objective is to be oversubscribed on that 50. And so think of, if we were to look at the product model looking down, it's much like casting a net out into the market. If I want 50 people in my core product over the course of a year, broadly speaking, I'll probably need about 500 people to consume the product for prospect over the course of the year. Whether that be doing our online quiz, getting, um, coming along to one of our conferences or our events, and then I'll need about uh, 500, let's call it 2,500 to 5,000 people consuming the gifts, listening to the podcast, watching videos, maybe getting a copy of our book, things like that. So when it comes to client acquisition and lead generation, the mistake is to run around trying to find 50 people for your core business. Whereas the trick to generating clients is to cast a wide enough net where your job is to find channels of distribution to be able to have 2,500, 5,000 people watching your videos online or downloading a podcast or doing an online diagnostic tool or getting a copy of your book or a report or whatever it may be. And to give stuff away for free. Now, is it easier to go out and give stuff away for free or sell? Much easier to give stuff away for free. Um, however, as a result of consuming that stuff, by the time you do get to the sales conversation, it's a much easier conversation to have. And the ultimate objective is to be oversubscribed on that 50. So like I said, you know, if you've got 50 people uh, you want in, in your core business over the course of a year, you, know, you, you need to talk to five to 10 times that in, in hot prospects, 10 to 20 times in warm, 100 to 250 times in, uh, in cold. So final example, um, JP uh, runs a, um, uh, he's a, a fitness trainer. We met him about six years ago. He joined our very first accelerator. Uh, when in 2010, he was working with 60 clients, 45, uh, 45 pounds an hour, seven hours a day, 270 days of the year. He was earning roughly 86,000 pounds. He then uh, shifted his model away from hourly to package. So he reduced the number of clients he worked with uh, but delivered 4,000 pound transformations to 32 people over the course of the year. Uh, and then he put in an extra product 
which was uh, retreats for 20 people in the year. So that took them to about 168. Thousand pounds. That's the example of one of his retreats in Thailand. Uh, that's a that's the copy of his uh, first book that he created, Seventy Seven Ways to Reshape Your Life. And this was six years ago, so um, designs come a long way since then. But uh, in two thousand and fifteen. Uh, he then shifted the model again, product extended, developed a few different layers of product, reduced the number of clients again, uh, but started working with four CEOs at £36,000 a year, uh, six executives at 24, he did 20 talks at £800, and he did 20 people on retreats, uh, and that took him up in revenue. So reduced the amount of time and energy and effort, but that takes time to get to that point. He needed to have a very uh, visible brand and reputation to get to the point where he could actually uh, do that. And so his latest book's called How to Move from Ordinary to Extraordinary. Uh, and he, he very much evolved over that period of time and the sophistication and of uh, you know, how his brand was positioned evolved over time as well. The final thing is to be able to go out and uh, sell your products, the big mistake I see a lot of service businesses making is they don't have good collateral and content and brochures. Uh, it might seem counterintuitive, given that we live in this digital world and everyone's promoting uh, digital, and, and digital's great, don't get me wrong, but when you're selling a high ticket core product and package, to be able to sit down in a sales conversation and walk someone through professional, well-designed collateral and brochures is, the, is a, a game changer when it comes to converting them and selling them. Because it's, the challenge is when you're presenting the value proposition of what you do, and especially if it's intangible, because you can't touch it, right, you can talk to the blue in the face, it doesn't carry the same credibility and authority when it's in print. Right, you, you take the systematic way that you're saying you're going to get them from problem to prize and turn it into a brochure where it walks them through step by step each of the stages they're going to go through what's the outcome at each of those stages, how each of those link together and how it actually gets people to an outcome and a, a result and a prize, all of a sudden uh, that proposition is far more credible in the eyes of your prospect. So you know, we, we, do a, we have a lot of digital assets and digital content, but we also have a lot of physical uh, content and assets as well. And so we've got little booklets and brochures that we walk our prospects through in sales conversations. That's the, the glue that helps to convert people into the core product. Uh, and then we've got brochures and offer forms and terms and conditions and all sorts of different things that, again, communicate a lot of credibility in the sales conversation. So some of the mistakes, um, only having one product or service. You need an ecosystem of products and services. Hopefully the example of JP shows that uh, the, the more layers of product you've got, uh, the ultimately the more revenue that you can generate. Targeting the wrong customer. So if they don't have the money to spend to address the problems that you're solving, wrong customer to be targeting. The products aren't remarkable, not delivering a really remarkable transformation. The ecosystem isn't stitched well together. Um, you know, the focus isn't on the prize, it's on, the, it's on your skills, experience, methodology. The focus needs to be on the outcome. Uh, and it lacks collateral, underutilizing tech, underutilizing retainers and passive income. So, guys, thank you, that's it. I um, hope this has been useful and valuable. And uh, before we wrap up, has anyone got any questions that you want to ask? In a book? Uh, no. So, I mean, like, paperback's fine. Yeah, but oh, as opposed to digital? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there, there is something called thud factor. It's a technical term. Um, when, you, when you drop some, something on someone's, you sit down for a prospecting meeting, and you, um, you, know, you, say, you, can, you can say, hey, look, I've featured in these different articles and media online. It carries a certain amount of credibility. But you rock up to that prospecting meeting and you put a copy of your book down on the table and you pull out some beautifully designed brochures and you walk them through your approach, your method, how you actually get people to an outcome. Thud factor. More credible. Uh, so, yeah, 
Yeah, so one of the most effective channels for uh, generating leads and marketing is uh, partners, partnerships. So uh, promoting stuff on, on Facebook and Google and all that kind of thing is, is pretty noisy. Um, you need to be you know, running sophisticated sales and marketing to know how to effectively use those channels. However, if I go and pitch a organization or a community that already has access to my target market, and I say, guys, you know, this is who we are, what we do, we have a chat, we explore you know, our philosophy and ideology around what we both do. It's like, great, look, you know, it seems like we align and connect. It's like, let's collaborate. And uh, you know, I did this with Net Registry, who's a big supplier of domain names and web hosting and things like that for businesses in Australia, uh, 50,000 people on database. And if I'd said to them, guys, can you uh, send out an email to your database promoting that we run business accelerators, 15 grand, intensive, et cetera, et cetera, uh, again, would have got a flat no. Whereas I say, look, it's Christmas coming up. Um, how would you like to give a copy of the Key Person Influence book to everyone on your database this year as a Christmas gift? Just to say thanks for being a client. And they go, oh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, but you know, 20 bucks a book, I don't, you know, I don't know if we've got the marketing budget for it. I'm like, look, that's OK. We've got the marketing budget for it. We'll, we'll uh, handle the postage, and we'll send it out. Um, you just send an email. You keep the kudos. Make you look good, good for us to get the message out there. They go, it sounds great. And so they send an email out. All of a sudden, 1,000 people opt in for a copy of the book. Now, it cost me five bucks to produce the book. Cheap. Cheap lead. Would everyone agree? Can't, you can't get, a, can't get a digital lead that, that cheap online. Um, however, as someone gets that email in their inbox talking about activating the dormant market, and they, and they all of a sudden get an email talking about the principles of becoming a key person influence, do you reckon prior to getting that email, five minutes before that, they were thinking to themselves, geez, I'd like to become a key person of influence this year? They weren't thinking about it, right? And all of a sudden, that proposition's presented to them. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, it's free. Why not? Put my details in. They'll send it out. Comes in the mail. They start flicking through. Page by page, it's unraveling and unfurling. What are all the ideas that they need to, uh, the light bulbs that need to go off to get them to a point where now they're suddenly aware of their problems? Small business owner, perfect target market, weren't thinking about brand differentiating, becoming a key person of influence. All of a sudden presented through that book, and it, the book walks them through a framework and a very logical argument as to why that makes a lot of sense. Like, huh, that makes a lot of sense. Right? So we've activated a, a dormant market. So partnerships are probably, the, for us, the most effective channel. To act, open up a partnership, you need a really great pitch. You need great products. You need these kind of assets. Uh, to do it. But um, guys, I hope this has been useful and valuable. Thanks very much for having me. Appreciate it.